Hey seniors, how's it going? All right, um, look, so we're going to talk today about the Cuban Missile Crisis, all right? This is one of the most frightening moments in world history. It is the closest we ever came to a nuclear war to World War III, right? All right, so think of it as coming out of the context of this mounting tension between Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, leader of the Soviet Union, and John F. Kennedy, right? Both of these men or kind of testing each other. Both of them want to be the tough guy. Both of them want to force the other guy to back down, okay? And we talked yesterday about the mounting tension between the two coming off of Kennedy's inauguration in 1961. Not long after the inauguration, he attempts the Bay of Pigs invasion, which is an invasion of Cuban exiles who are hoping to achieve a coup and bring Castro out of power in Cuba. But they're, of course, backed up by American air support and American naval support. And it's, of course, a complete and horrific failure for Kennedy, the Bay of Pigs invasion is, right? Awful. Doesn't go right. And it's embarrassing, okay? And, and, and Khrushchev is horrified and angry about it, right? Because he, <laughs> Castro was like his protector, right? He's the satellite state for the Soviet Union. And so Khrushchev is then, <clears throat> when he meets Kennedy that summer, demanding... You know, uh, you know, some answers for that whole situation, but then also re, uh, bringing back this controversy surrounding um, the um, uh, surrounding Berlin and the flow of refugees out of the Soviet zone of the city into the American zone of the city. And Khrushchev is going to focus on this particular issue as a kind of a flashpoint to um, challenge Kennedy on. Okay. And say, look, we gotta we gotta stop the flow of refugees from Soviet Berlin to American Berlin. And <clears throat> once you get into American Berlin, then you can escape from Soviet Russia, pretty uh, from from Eastern Communist Germany into the West into freedom. Okay. And so, of course, what Khrushchev does then in the summer of 1962, without telling anyone, is to build the Berlin Wall, a physical barrier within the city, heavily guarded by Soviet troops, cutting the city in two cutting families into if you're in different parts of the city. So, you know, Kennedy does not respond rashly to this. Does so they have, you know, but there is a moment when the world is looking and saying, look, this is, looks like war is about to break out because you've got Soviet tanks facing off against American tanks in the city of Berlin as the wall is going up. But luckily, the crisis is averted. <clears throat> Kennedy allows the wall to go up. It's in the Soviet zone. They can do that. But he also reinforces American military presence in the free part of the city, the non-communist part of the city, to ensure, you know, to, to say it's the people of Berlin not abandoning you, right? <clears throat> but crisis averted. But what it does is it, it's then, the tension is then going to mount over the next year up to the point of the Cuban Missile Crisis, okay? And the person we're going to blame for it really is Khrushchev. Khrushchev is at fault for the, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. He just says, now, starting in the late summer and the autumn of 1961, right after the Berlin Wall crisis, he's thinking that Kennedy is going to attempt another invasion of Cuba, okay? And Kennedy was not attempting this or planning this. There were those, of course, in the administration who really wanted it to be on the table, certainly as an option, but there was no plan in place, okay? But Khrushchev is thinking this is a likelihood, and so he's sending lots of military operatives into Cuba, 42,000 people. He's sending weapons, and then he's sending missiles starting in the, <clears throat> in the autumn of 1961. Of course, it takes a little time to get these things set up, right? You got to build like missile silos. You got to have, you got to, you know, have uh, construction of sites that where you can launch the, launch the missile. Okay. But <clears throat> they're, go they're, they're going, they're sending the stuff there and it is in secret, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, then, okay, then um, about a year later, in September of 1962, we've, we've learned about the missiles in Cuba. Okay, what did we learn? Well, the CIA was getting more and more suspicious of Khrushchev, okay, and, and then the U-2 reconnaissance planes, the things that are flying up there 80,000 feet in the air with the big cameras on them, and they capture what's happening down on the ground there, okay? And so um, these missiles are offensive missiles, right? Meaning that they are, they are designed to be able to strike the United States 
Um, and so, you know, not that <clears throat> Khrushchev was going to launch him immediately, but he wanted him dead so he could threaten to do it, right? And these are um, <clears throat> medium range. They can go about 1,100 miles before they're going to come down and blow up something. But they could reach population centers in the United States easily. And, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, so that's, that's the type of missile you're dealing here with. The other really dangerous thing about the situation was that Khrushchev had given um, the Russian officials in Cuba the authority to launch the missiles. So they didn't even have to run it past him. They could start nuclear war if they wanted to, right? Um, no. <clears throat> okay. The missiles themselves were not carrying nuclear warheads, these missiles. The, the, the medium range ones, but there were short range ones that did have nuclear warheads on them <coughs> in Cuba as well, okay? And those would have theoretically been launched at American planes or ships if they were coming for retali in retaliation for a strike against the U.S., right? Just some of the, some of the scenarios, right? Okay, so we learn about the, the missiles in late, um, in the autumn then <coughs> of, um, I guess it's in October, when, when um, we learn the extent of the, of the problem there in Cuba with the missiles. And then there's 13 days of deliberation within Kennedy's, uh, Kennedy's close circle of advisors about what to do. Very tense. And unlike what happened with the Bay of Pigs invasion, where Kennedy kind of goes with the, you know, the decisive voice in the room, he wants to pull lots of people together and get lots of different perspectives this time. So he's got people who are conciliatory, uh, who are going to be pushing for a diplomatic solution. And he's got people who are hawks, who are going to be more willing to um, <clears throat> explore military, a military response, even a preemptive strike. So on the conciliatory side, you've got Adlai Stevenson, who is saying, look, you, you, you've you got some, what are called these Jupiter missiles in Turkey, an ally of the United States, and those things are there, and they are annoying to the Soviet Union in the same way that missiles in Cuba are annoying to the United States. And also, we don't need those missiles there because they're only useful if we're going to launch a preemptive strike against the Soviet Union, which we're not planning on doing. And also, now we have submarine missiles, so they're obs these things. These things in Turkey are obsolete. We don't need them there to protect Turkey or whatever. So um, <clears throat> Kennedy um, is going to resist this kind of diplomatic. Here, let me offer to give up something in order to get you to take away something. It's too soft. It's too conciliatory. It's too like, let me lie down before I even like make a demand. And Kennedy says, no, the situation is serious. It's not just about um, getting rid of the missiles, of course, but it's about showing that we're not, we're not willing to step down. We're going to, we're going to put a stop to this before it gets fully in place. Like we, we're the ones making the demands. We're not making an offer. First, we're making demands first. Get the missiles out of Cuba. And it, he's saying, look, we got to take the strong stance because we got to show Khrushchev that we're not weak. And also, it, he's thinking in terms of politics, if he had taken a softer stance, it would have done well for him in politics, okay? Um, so he's going to reject the Stevenson argument. The other side of the thing, coin is the like Hawk argument. There are a lot of more guys, including the Vice President Lyndon Johnson, who want an airstrike to take out the missile fields that are under construction in Cuba. Okay, and this would have probably caused war because the Cubans or the Soviets would have re responded with some kind of strike and things could have escalated very easily. There's even one guy, Fulbright, who was saying, you just need to invade now, go. Okay, um, and um, Kennedy, luckily, is going to, thankfully, is going to resist these promptings, um, largely thanks to, his, thanks to his brother, Robert Kennedy. Robert was his attorney general and one of his closest and most trusted advisors. And Robert is arguing... Okay, if you take this action, first of all, um, you're going to be killing civilians probably, and that you shouldn't do that. And two, we don't really like th this is much more likely to result in a war. And 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 we and if we're the ones that start the war because we made the preemptive strike, history is not going to deal well with us, especially if this ends up being a full-scale nuclear war. Okay, and he says you you, you really don't want to be you don't want to be doing a preemptive strike. And so JFK at the last minute says, okay, we're not going to do an airstrike. We're not going to do it. We're going, we're going to try a diplomatic <clears throat> route. And he says, we're going to impose a quarantine on Cuba. We're not going to let the Soviets bring any military um, weapons into Cuba anymore. And we're going to enforce this with the U.S. Navy in the Caribbean Sea in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so he decides this is the, what they're going to do, the quarantine option. He sends this message to Khrushchev the night of October 22nd, 
One hour later, he goes on national television to tell the American people about the quarantine and about the missiles in Cuba. And then, you know, that night, October 22nd, there were, there were Soviet ships that were already on their way to Cuba with weapons in them. And so now all the world is watching on television, waiting to see what the Soviets are going to do. Because Kennedy has promised that if the Soviet ships continue on their course to Cuba and they get close to the waters around Cuba, then the United States will attack them. There will be full retaliatory response okay, if, you, if you breach the quarantine. So the question is, will the Soviets back down or will they respect the quarantine? And if, they, if the Soviets don't back down and the Americans attack and the Soviets then counterattack, you're looking probably at a nuclear war. And so the world is really waiting with its breath held the night of October 22nd, waiting to see what happens the next morning.